presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kavoris. I'd first like to uh, thank everybody for the great hospitality and uh, making me feel so welcome at your just truly beautiful campus here at University of Arkansas. Uh, today, as I said, the title is Hydration, Physiological Qu Consequences, and Performance Implications. Do I have to aim this at something? I think I'll just, I can do this. No, it doesn't seem to change. Oh, there we go, okay. The outline that'll follow is I'm going to first give a very brief review of heat stress because I think this will bring together a lot of the concepts that we'll be covering. We'll discuss water balance, water redistribution with water deficits, aerobic performance, the mechanisms that may be responsible for any impaired performance, and then as requested, I'll finish on hypervolemia and hyperhydration. Let's talk about heat stress just so we're all on the same page. When an individual goes to the heat, the most significant event that occurs physiologically is cutaneous vasodilation or moving blood from the central core to the periphery for heat, heat loss. You increase skin blood flow and you increase skin blood volume. And that's shown here by the distribution of temperature by the warm blood moving to the periphery. Sitting in this room, you probably have a skin blood flow well under a liter. And if you were in a warm environment and just doing some heavy work, you might have a skin blood flow of about five liters. And here we can show the impact of the cardiovascular impact of the warmth skin. Here we have the change in heart rate during moderate intensity exercise at the same intensity across a variety of different skin temperatures that are being modified by a water perfuse suit. And as you can see, a light work, core temperature is about the same in all these conditions, but as you warm the skin and the blood goes to the periphery, heart rate goes up showing considerable cardiovascular strain. Well, why is this? We can see this from some experiments from Dr. Larry Rao, where what he did is he had individuals again in a water profuse suit. Here though, they, it was 20 degrees C, warmed it up, brought it down to 10 degrees, warmed again up, this made the skin warm. You can see that with the skin warming up to areas of 38 degrees and above, the first thing that occurs with the skin warming is a drop in total peripheral resistance because you're dilating, you open up a vascular tree, so peripheral resistance drops. As a result of that, venous return and right atrial pressure decreases. This decreases the stroke volume, driving up the heart rate. And in this instance, because it was light exercise, cardiac output or blood flow from the heart was maintained. But if it was a little more intense work, that would not be the case. Now, we know then, as I showed you, that as you increase environmental heat stress, skin temperature goes up and so does skin blood flow requirements. We also take it for granted that exercise performance will decrease in a systematic manner with heat stress. Here's an example of, of, of a, a study done by Matt Ely where he looked at marathon performance and as a function of WBGT, which is an index of heat strain. And if we use the, the uh, areas, the, the categorizations of Rich Gonzalez, you could see this would be equal to low, moderate, and moderate to high heat strain. WBGT is from 10 to 25 degrees. And what you can see is when you go back and you look at p past marathons, you can see a syst systematic slowing uh, decrement. It takes them longer to run the marathon race, with the slower runners showing a greater effect than the lower runners. So, we take it for granted then that heat aerobic performance is degraded by heat, and I showed you one of a number of mechanisms which we're going to get into a little bit later. So for heat stress then, we can say that heat stress induces a cutaneous vasodilation, or this an increase of the vascular space, which I'm going to call a relative hypovolemia, which I'll get back to defining that shortly. That heat stress induces a cardiovascular challenge, and heat stress impairs aerobic performance. Now let's move on to hydration and water balance. The first question is, is how do we define normal water, body water, or a fluctuation in normal body water? Here's a cartoon that was, I think, originally done by John Greenleaf, where what he shows is that when we look at normal body water balance, or eu hydration, and normal total body water, there's a sine wave. There's normal variability. 
And if water body, body water is greater than normal variability, we could say a person's hyperhydrated. And if body water is less or total body water is less than that, you have a deficit, you would have hypohydration. So the first question is, what is normal variation in total body water? And what can you use as a definition for hypohydration or a water deficit greater than normal variance? Well, if you look at measures of total body water, the day-to-day -day variability is about uh, 4% coefficient of variance for total body water. But we know with total body water measurements, there's a lot of measurement error. And much of this variability may be just due to the measurement error. If we control for um, external factors that might influence body mass, and we look at variability in body mass, and if we assume that this is due to changes in, in total body water, we find that the coefficient of variation is about 0.7%. So, what we do is we say that if it's about 0.7%, that what would be two standard deviations or greater than a 95% chance that that was a different, uh, basically, body mass. So we'll use a body mass change of about 2%, which is a little bit in excess of, of two standard deviation changes of your normal fluctuation. Now, this 2% change in body mass, we're assuming that it's a normal uh, body composition person, that would be basically probably about a 3% difference in body water. Um, again, though, if it's an obese person, it's going to be different than a lean person because we know lean body, body water is about 70% of lean body mass for all species. So we say that anything greater than a 2% fluctuation in body mass due to a loss of body water would be defined as hypohydration. We also, though, if we look at the physiological compensation for fluid loss, we know that with that amount of loss that if we use a sweat-induced dehydration, we get a sufficient increase in osmolality that we start uh, trying to defend body water, as well as if we did a, a, just an isotonic reduction in total body water, we get a readjustment. So it also is about where we see the threshold, in simple words, where we start seeing compensations to sustain total body water. So I'll define then hypohydration as a 2% reduction in body mass, or about a 3% reduction in total body water. Well, here's some data from the Institute of Medicine report where we went back to the NHANES database. And we were wondering that if we use plasma osmolality, which it seems to be the best marker of body hydration, at least in terms of uh, 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 intracellular dehydration, if basically, if individuals that fell within the first decile or the tenth, individuals that were, don't drink much or drink a lot daily, if they would vary in hydration status. So hundreds of uh, pieces of data were pulled from each age group. And when you start looking at within either any age group, either men or women, what you can see is you'd expect an osmolality roughly of around 280. But what's important is that you see that individuals normally functioning, that there's no difference in the, uh, the people that drink the highest or the smallest amounts of water. So what this tells you is that the general population that's relatively sedentary, that on a daily basis, they're in good water balance and don't suffer necessarily from hypohydration. And in fact, as you all know, the reason for this is that we have exquisite uh, responses at the kidneys to be able to either conserve water or to diurese and to excrete water. And as you can see here, taken from the old handbook physiology, some nice data from Lee, that if, if we look, we can see that the range in ability to produce urine it can be from a low level of about 15 mils to up almost a liter per hour. So that if the body water then is decreased due to dehydration or hypohydration, as you all know, urine output goes down, so you'd be able to conserve water, and if you drink too much, you excrete it, and this allows you to sustain in water balance. So for an average individual who's not that active, that's eating a normal meal, hydration shouldn't really be a problem, except for some special cases. The problem we have is when individuals are going to have very high sweat rates and have high levels of water loss, such as physical exercise and heat stress. Here's uh, just a conceptual diagram based on some data where you look at sweat rate as a function of running speed and looking at a cool to a hot humid environment. And what you can see, it's not unusual for individuals to have sweat rate, particularly in Arkansas, I'm sure in the summer, if you're outdoors being active, well in excess of one liter per hour. And this is where we get a problem, because I'm going to show you some data from John Greenleaf's actual doctoral dissertation, 
but it's been shown throughout the literature, and in fact, John's data lines up 100% with the data that was collected in the 40s by Adolf, almost to, to the exact numbers, in that people will underdrink. When they have high levels of fluid loss, they will not consume adequate amounts of fluid. So here what we have is experiments that were done where individuals were put in different environments and different activity levels to induce different sweat losses from a low level up to over, well over one liter per hour. This is your line of no difference. So if they were drinking the same that they lost, data points would fall on this. And what you can see here is that at low levels of sweat loss, people do fine. But as you start having high rates of sweat loss, that if individuals will drink voluntarily, they will underconsume. And basically what they'll do is they'll replace about half of what they lost. And these numbers are, again, identical almost to what Dr. Adolph showed in the 40s. And I might add that these data showing that you replace about half are on heat acclimatized subjects. And an unacclimatized person, there's data to show, will have a greater deficit. So individuals then, if they have high sweat rates, will underconsume. And as I said, this is not a new concept. If you go back and you look at this historically, you can see from uh, Dr. Dill in the Harvard Fatigue Lab when they worked on the building of the dam at Boulder City, they reported, as well as experiments later, consistently throughout the 30s and 40s through the 60s, that people just do not replace fluids adequately. So this is not a new concept. It's been shown for decades, and it's been shown for decades about the same amounts of deficits. So as we look at body water balance, I think the important points that I want to come away with you is that hypohydration, at least we're going to define it now, as a total body water deficit equal to about 2% of body mass or about 3 to 4% of total body water. And again, we just use body mass as a surrogate for total body water because we know that lean body mass is consistent in, in, in the content. The sedentary persons in temperate conditions maintain hydration quite well. But with exercise, heat stress, when you have high sweat losses, you can have very substantial water deficits. Well, let's now look at this body water and how it's redistributed when we have a deficit. For the average uh, male in this room, you probably have a total body water of about 45 liters. Okay? And that total body water is broken up in your intracellular space, your intracellular fluid, and your extracellular fluid. Your intracellular fluids, your largest compartment, it's about twice as big as your extracellular fluid compartment. Your extracellular fluid compartment is your interstitial fluid and your plasma. And again, that's about one third. Now, as physiologists, we often think about the plasma because it's easy to measure to get blood samples. Now, if we look, though, the largest body water is the intracellular fluid. It exchanges with the extracellular fluid by osmotic exchange by basically, if you change the electrolyte concentration or, or, and pull fluids from one space to another by osmotic exchange. Whereas between the interstitial and the plasma, it's starling forces, as you remember, hydrostatic pressures, oncotic pressures, which would re redistribute that volume. So if we have an individual with whatever the level of fluid loss is, we would then have, if we had an output that exceeded the fluid intake, we would have a water deficit and we'd have a redistribution. If we have sweat, we all know that sweat is hypotonic relative to plasma. It's sodium poor, particularly if you're heat acclimatized. As a result, if you dehydrate by sweat, the sodium stays behind. That's your largest extracellular cation. It, pull, it causes an osmotic gradient and pulls intracellular fluid so that it's distributed more equally from all the spaces. If you basically dehydrate due to cold stress, high altitude, or taking a, a loop diuretic, you're predominantly going to lose in the urine, you're going to lose electrolytes, as well as the urine proportionally. And as a result, you don't have this osmotic gradient, and almost all the fluid will come from the extracellular spaces, and you'll see a large reduction in plasma volume. So here's a study that was done by Dave Costell, and what they did is they had individuals dehydrate by either 3, 6, or 9 percent in total body, body mass loss, body water loss, and they showed the breakout between the plasma, interstitial fluid, and intracellular fluid. And what you can see at a low level of water loss, most of the fluid came from the extracellular space. But as you started getting to more to a moderate level, because the, the sodium was left behind, it caused an osmotic gradient, you get about an equal breakout between intracellular and extracellular uh, fluid loss with sweat-induced dehydration at both the moderate and the high levels.
And you can see plasma was proportionate at each of these. And as I showed you earlier, plasma is about 8 or 9% of the total body water. So the loss from there basically represented what occurred from the extracellular space. Now, so when we lose fluid, we lose it from all of our compartments. But depending on the solute loss, the composition may be changed uh, somewhat. If we look at different tissues, there's been a number of studies that have been done over the years with animals, taking the animals, the organs out, desiccating them, and looking at wet and dry weight. And basically what they show is that if you, in this particular study by, by Hiroshi and Jose, that when the animals dehydrate it by 10%, you can see you lost water proportionally from both the muscle and the liver, as well the GI tract, which has a lot of uh, fluid associated with it. But we've always believed that the brain was protected. And we've also known that the brain, with an osmotic stress, can produce different osmolites that will help protect its volume. So the belief was then that as you dehydrate it, brain would not, would basically retain its water content. However, with the uh, at recent advent of imaging, we're starting to get a somewhat of a different picture. Here's two studies uh, that were both done by Kempton and his group. And the first one is they looked at basically a low level of dehydration. And they looked at the change in, uh, in uh, white and gray matter within the brain. And you can see, although not significant, but when you look at the cluster, five of the seven individuals, even with a very low level of body water, seem to show reduction in brain volume. Another study has shown, and in fact, a series of studies, at least four studies that I'm aware of, that have consistently shown this, always with very small n, is that if we look at the ventricles within the brain, that as you decrease total body water, they may expand. And this would be consistent with losing water from the brain tissue, thus this ventricle space would expand. So it appears then that what we've always thought, that the brain may not be influenced by dehydration, at least structurally, that this may be changing. And this is something that we're pursuing right now at, at Georgia Tech. Now, so the brain and all tissues can be affected. If we actually go to the blood where we measure the circulating blood, you can see that if we look again at levels of water loss and we compare it to normal hydration, this would be your dashed line, that as you become dehydrated due to sweat loss, that your plasma osmolality goes up in a linear, fanier, linear manner from sweat-induced dehydration. Okay, and that if we look at the change in plasma volume, the absolute blood volume, or the liquid portion of the plasma volume, will go down in a linear manner, but with a considerable amount of, of scatter. So osmolality will go up and blood volume will go down, and we know that these are two important signals also for water conservation, and I'll also show you the very important signals for the changes in physiology which may impact on performance. Now, like I said though, if you just look at the plasma, that how you lose your solute is going to have an impact. Here's data uh, that Sam Shravant put together. And again, we look at the, the reduction in body mass due to dehydration to the change in plasma volume. And here's sweat-induced dehydration. And over here, we gave them a loop diuretic. And what you can see is that, as I had told you earlier, that if you dehydrate it and you do it from sweat, your plasma volume will reduce in a linear manner but it's not as of a great of a reduction as if you use a diuretic, because here the solute remains behind. You can pull intracellular fluid into the vascular space. Here you cannot. So how you dehydrate is going to impact on the signals of osmolality and are going to impact on the signals of plasma volume changes. And I'm going to get to this in a minute, but I think that the changes in plasma volume are very important. And, and most obvious is that as the plasma volume decreases, the filling of the heart will decrease. And here's some nice data taken from, uh, whoops, from Ethan Nadell, where they had individuals exercise in the heat at a low intensity work, and they dehydrated them via a variety of different methods. And what you can see, that as the plasma volume decreased, so the blood volume decreased, cardiac filling of the heart actually decreased going back to the same slides. So what you can see, by just simply removing water from the vascular space, making that volume smaller, you see the same type of a thing that you see with heat stress, where you're expanding the vascular space. So, and these are two important points that I want you to come away with as we start talking about performance. That with hypohydration and heat stress, we have what's called a hypovolemia. But we have, in one instance, as I just said, 
with dehydration, we have what's called an absolute hypovolemia. That what we've done is we've got a given, here's your normal va vascular volume, is that you reduce the volume for a given vascular space. We've taken fluid out, so the volume goes down, and that's called an absolute hypovolemia. When we combine it with heat stress, dehydration has an absolute hypovolemia, but even if we had the same blood volume, remember when I showed you with the heat, the vascular tree expands? Well, when the vascular tree expands, that given blood volume, even if it hasn't been reduced, is actually a hypovolemia because your vascular space has expanded. And what I will be showing you with dehydration and heat, that you have both an absolute hypovolemia and a relative hypovolemia working together. So my points then on body water distribution is that body, wa body water deficits reduce both the intracellular and extracellular fluid volumes, that water deficits cause plasma loss, that plasma loss depends on the magnitude of the water loss as well as the, so the sodium loss or the solute loss, that the plasma loss can reduce cardiac filling, and that when you have dehydration and exercise heat stress, you have both this relative and this absolute hypovolemia, and both of these can have additive effects on the cardiovascular system and perhaps exercise performance. Now we'll move on. So I think we have the background information of heat stress and hydration. What impact does hypohydration have on exercise performance? Recently this has kind of become a somewhat controversial issue at least in the exercise science uh, media. And basically, there's been two views, um, one by myself and others, and another one put forward by Dr. Noakes. And um, what we did is we did a, a contrasting perspective paper invited in MedSci Sports Exercise, where we've actually laid out at least what I think is fairly our, our two different opinions. Um, mine was called the prevailing view, and that is, is that basically if you have a greater than a 2% reduction in body mass, or 3% in total body water, if you're exercising in warm, hot environments, aerobic performance will be impaired. And we'll talk about the mechanisms, but there's multiple mechanisms involved. Uh, Dr. Noakes has taken the opinion that some people do better, some people do worse when they're dehydrated. Some individuals can incur water losses up to 10% of body mass loss. Uh, he hasn't, to my knowledge, uh, basically, uh, considered the difference in environmental conditions, and he thinks that if there is a performance decrement that thirst is responsible, and also not in this paper but certainly consistently put out is that the idea that dehydration will impair performance is something that's been put forth by the sports beverage business. So it's a recent phenomenon. Well, let's look at uh, the impact on performance. First, just as I told you, you can go back to the 30s where individuals noticed that folks would underdrink when working outdoors in the heat and their performance would degrade. Well, here's studies that would say that at least in the 40s, well before sports beverages, that there's with dehydration or reduction in body water, that there's a deterioration in reduced performance. Uh, here's a 45 and a 1947 study. In addition, here, here's some data that uh, taken from Adolf's famous book, Man in the Desert. Uh, where I've taken data, and I think, to be honest with you, some of these may be extrapolated points, but I think most of it's data, where he actually conducted experiments outdoors. He had soldiers in the desert uh, carrying different backpacks, and either loaded them with rocks or different amounts of water. And they were interested in how long you could survive if you had a forced march in limited water. So, how, you know, how far should we look for, for people? And basically, then they had them walk under different environmental conditions. And what you can see that uh, these were outdoor studies. They walked with different amounts of water. And two things I, I think are kind of obvious. A, when it got warmer, regardless of how much water they carried, their performance went down. And as you reduce the amount of water they carried, they covered less territory. So performance degraded. And it, when you got really hot, you didn't maybe see as great of a performance degradation because the effects of the heat uh, basically covered some of the effects of just the water a shortage alone. But again, performance was degraded. What I've done here is I've gone to the literature and I've pulled out studies that meet the criteria of having at least a 2% body mass reduction and they've done some sort of a modern exercise performance test. These are just submaximal intensity studies. What I've done is I've taken these studies 
and I've ordered them by the environmental condition that they were conducted. So we got cold studies here, temperate, and now we get warm and we get hot. The time TT stands for time trial, and the TTTE -T -T -E are time uh, to exhaustion. The time to exhaustion tests are longer, there's more variability, so you'll generally see a greater percent reduction. We looked at the body mass loss, that within each environment, then we, we arranged these by lower to higher body mass losses, and whether or not they noted a significant reduction in performance. These ones here that are sort of in uh, yellow, I'll call them, I'm not good with my colors, these are studies that were out of our lab that used a very similar design, and you're going to see these brought together later on, so that's why they're coded. What you can see is that if you're in a cold environment, cold or cool environment, where you're vasoconstricted, the vascular space is small, there's no impact on performance. And again, these are paired tests, that when it starts getting to temperate kinds of conditions, sometimes you see a reduction in performance, sometimes you don't. As you start getting warmer, and we're going to talk a little bit about the mechanisms, but when you start getting to where you would actually vasodilate the skin, now you start seeing consistent reductions in performance. All studies show a reduction in performance. So I think that when you look at the studies, again, no one's ever argued for cold, or, and I don't think many people have argued about temperate, but it's when it's hot, when you dehydrate, and that when it's warm to hot, you see performance decrements at least based on these analysis. Now here's a study that was done by Bob Canefect, and these are very nice studies that he did, where what, what Bob did is he had the four groups of individuals perform paired time trial performance tests in a 10, 20, 30, and 40 degree environment. The way these were set up was that we had it set up so that it was a uh, compensable heat stress condition. So in these conditions, regardless of the ambient temperature, the core temperature was going to be about the same, but we systematically increased the skin temperature and the calculated skin blood flow responses. I think if my memory serves me correct, it, under a half a liter here, maybe around uh, seven-tenths of a liter skin blood flow estimated requirement, maybe, four, maybe three or four liters here, and maybe six or seven. So as they go to these different conditions, skin's warmer and skin blood flow requirements. Might also add that if you look, the data is in another paper, that under all of these experiments, each group of subjects, there was no difference between environmental condition and thirst. Obviously, it was higher when they were hypohydrated than you hydrated, but no differences between the environmental conditions. So here we have the individual data in the line and no difference. You can see that in the cold environment, the points fall right on the line and no difference. That in the temperate environment, uh, some of the people fall below, just misses significance. When you now go to a warm environment, everybody except one individual impairs performance. And now when you go to a hot environment, you can see everybody shows a fairly significant reduction in performance. So you can see there's variability, but as your skin blood flow and your warmth increases, consistent reductions. So what we did then is we took these different studies uh, that we've done with similar methodologies using paired time trial performance tests. So we've got 53 paired observations, 53 tests you hydrated, 53 tests when hypohydrated by about 3 to 4 percent of body mass. These people all performed a series of practice tests, and this is shown in the gray area that you basically your test retest reliability was about coefficient of variation about 5 percent. So here we have the mean data points for the performance change for the group, uh, each of the groups from these studies and the 95% confidence intervals. Now, we present here the data by a function of skin temperature, because really the skin temperature is going to drive the skin blood flow response with some other stuff. But for here, the way these ex experiments were conducted, low to high skin blood flow. And what you can see is when you do a regression analysis, you see just like when you brought all those studies together, but it can pinpoint a little bit more, that when you start getting about 27 degrees skin temperature and above, and as Dr. Crandall told you, that's about when you start getting cutaneous vasodilation, your performance starts degrading, and it starts degrading. The warmer you get, the higher your skin blood flow requirement, the greater the reduction in performance. So there's greater cardiovascular stress as we increase skin temperature because there's a greater relative hypovolemia because that vascular tree is growing. In addition, uh, here's some older data where we had individuals under uncompensable heat stress. 
Uncompensable heat stress, it's so overwhelming you can't thermoregulate. Your skin's maximally vasodilated, and you walk basically till you collapse because you just keep storing heat. So this is a model of heat exhaustion. And it has been reported in the literature that people are more likely to have heat exhaustion if they're, um, if they're hypohydrated. Here we had individuals walk to collapse in the heat uh, by setting up uncompensable conditions. And they obviously didn't go as long until they collapsed. And if we use a marker, in this instance we use core temperature as a marker, you can see that they would uh, basically have heat exhaustion at a much lower internal temperature. So I think it's fair to say that in heat, where you have this cutaneous vasodilation, and this relative hypovolemia, that you're going to have a performance decrement. Well, we were interested in what happens when you go to high altitude. Because with high altitude, you get a systemic cutaneous vasodilation also. And we were wondering, would individuals uh, have a reduction in performance at high altitude when they, again, had this systemic vasodilation? So John Castellani did a very nice study. And what he did is he had individuals uh, exercise, uh, do all the practice and stuff, but basically they worked in a warm environment. I think it was 37 degrees. They had them exercise at sea level and about, about 3,000 meters or about 10,000 feet. They did these same types of tests uh, when you hydrate it and hypohydrate it. So if you were uh, basically you hydrate it and you were at altitude, 3,000 feet, this the effect of being at high altitude. They had a 10% reduction in performance, and you can see the 95% confidence interval just kind of went into that uh, area of, of test retest reliability. When they were at sea level and hypohydrated, this group, the same group of subjects, they had a little bit, a little bit bigger, about maybe a 12% reduction, and this fell outside of this range. Now, when you go to high altitude and you are hypohydrated, you can see you have an additive effect that you really get the summing of the altitude and the dehydration, and again, a very large reduction in performance. So another situation where you have a relative hypovolemia, as that relative hypovolemia goes, performance decreases. So I think we can say then that if we look at hydration and aerobic performance, that hydration in, hypohydration impairs aerobic performance, that has been demonstrated since the 40s uh, in field and laboratory studies that laboratory studies consistently demonstrate impaired aerobic performance in warm, hot conditions. And I showed you that through both Bo uh, Bob's data, Kenefix, as well as the compilation of the literature. Our analysis shows that at around a skin temperature of 27 degrees, or when you start getting this vasodilation, that's when you start setting to see this reduction in performance. And as that skin temperature increases by each degree centigrade, you get about an additional 1.5% reduction in performance. And when you go to high altitude and you're exercising in warm conditions, that hypohydration has an additive effect on impairing the performance that's seen at high altitude. So I feel comfortable, at least in my mind, that under these situations, aerobic performance is decreased. Let's look at some of the mechanisms. Uh, in fact, this review paper just came out today by Lars Nibo, and I was fortunate enough to be a co-author with Lars. It's about a 40-page review of physiological mechanisms that reduce performance in the heat. And we've agreed that it's multifaceted and painstakingly goes through looking at the impact of the cardiovascular system, which I've explained to you today, but also the role of the central nervous system, peripheral muscular factors, psychological, as well as, as a respiratory effects. But again, in my opinion, this being the big player, but not everybody agrees with that, but all of these mechanisms are involved. So we have agreement that performance will reduce in heat. We have agreement that there's mechanisms that can, that can be responsible for this. Now when we move to hypohydration, what you're going to see, these same mechanisms that are thought to be responsible for performance reductions in the heat are by far magnified. So that these same mechanisms, if we agree they can reduce performance in the heat, we shouldn't have any argument with hypohydration in heat because they're far in excess to what we would see with heat stress. So let's look at this. First of all, uh, one of the most reproducible lab experiments you can do, and this has been shown throughout the years, that if you do an exercise bout at a given metabolic rate, if you take out water, your core temperature is going to be higher. So this is just a number of studies from the literature showing that, look, it, depending on these are the body water loss levels that they looked at, and these are the regression lines that, you know, and again, these go over decades, 
but you're going to get hotter if you exercise in the heat. So you're going to increase your body core temperature. Whether or not that's important, we'll get back to that, but that's going to occur. That if we look, here's a study that uh, looks at the individuals exercising in the heat and temperate conditions, different WBGT conditions, 12, 32, and 35. And this is the increase in core temperature and exercise above that of what was when you hydrated in terms of steady state core temperature. You can see that from this study that the greater the need of the thermoregulatory system, the greater the impairment. If you really need the thermoregulatory system because it's hotter, you're going to have a greater elevation in core temperature because as the thermoregulatory system comes in, it's being penalized or being adjusted. Here's two studies, and these show the two arms of the heat loss responses. Here's sweating rate, and here forearm blood flow responses. Um, here's you hydrated, again, forcing function analysis. This is when the sweating would turn on in the increase. This is what happens with hypohydration. You can see there's a delay, the threshold's higher, so you're storing more heat until you turn on, and then the sweating rate increases, maybe at the same slope or maybe less. Larry Kenny, who was a previous speaker to you, should very nicely with forearm blood flow or your skin blood flow responses that there's a change in threshold and it doesn't turn on as much. So we know that the thermal systems, regulatory system is involved. We know that you have a higher body temperature. And we also know that not only the, do you have a, a loss of sweating or a reduction in skin blood flow, but at least when we are able to do the sweating responses, either whole body or when we did local responses, you can see it's finely tuned. That here's two sets of experiments. This did whole body, and again, this did uh, local sweating responses, but we had people you hydrated and at different levels of dehydration. And you can see that regardless of whether it's local or, or whole body, you can see a fine tuning, a turning down of the sweat system, which makes sense. You turn it on later and you have a, a less efficient slope. And this makes sense because why? If I'm short of body water, I'm going to conserve. So I'm going to sweat less and I just fine tune this down. And when you look in, at, at studies that have looked at what's causing this, and there's been many studies out of our lab, Ethan Nadell's lab, Sue Fortney's lab, what you find is that they both play a role, but probably osmolality plays a greater effect on sweating. And here's a very nice study out of Japan where they looked at the threshold temperature for the onset of sweating and the threshold temperature for the onset of cutaneous vasodilation, and they infused uh, solutions so that they changed the plasma osmolality. And you can see that as the osmolality goes up, as would occur with sweat-induced dehydration, you start changing the threshold. So the thermoregulatory system's affected by both blood volume and osmolality, but it's finely tuned down, particularly the sweating with osmolality, to conserve body water. Now, I said earlier that if we go to the heat, and we have people work in the heat, and that we have decreased filling and stroke volume will drop and that may or may not impact on cardiac output. When we go and we look at individuals exercising in the heat and we have them dehydrated by different levels and we measure blood flow from the heart, the cardiac output, what we see is the following. Generally, if there's not a body water loss, they can sustain that cardiac output, at least at this intensity, or they might have a small drop with heat, prolonged heat exposure. But in Scott Montaigne's doctoral work with Eddie Coyle, he showed very nicely that as they replace, replace lower amounts of fluids, they had different levels of, of water loss, that as that water loss became greater, so my plasma became greater, my, my ventricular filling becomes lower, the stroke volume becomes lower, my heart rate goes up, that I can't compensate, and that my exercise cardiac output will decrease. So cardiac output will decrease if proportionate to the level of body water loss during fairly intense work in heat. When Scott came over to our institute, we looked at the one before was we created an absolute hypovolemia. What Scott did then is he had people exercise at different intensity. The harder you exercise, the greater your skeletal muscle vasodilation, so you're creating a relative hypovolemia. What Scott showed is that if you had individuals and you had them performing exercise, and he had three different intensities here, and this is the cardiac output response when you hydrate it, that whether 25, 45 or 60 percent, that as he looked at different time points, you can see when the individuals were hypohydrated by 3 or 4 percent, that the cardiac output was lower than when they were euhydrated, and the harder they were exercising, so the greater the skeletal muscle mass that was open, 
the greater the likelihood of the reduction in cardiac output. Now, many studies have shown, including the two that I showed you, that with exercise in the heat or with dehydration, that compared to control, here we have cardiac output. And again, Jose Alonzo Gonzalez, very nice study, people doing uh, exercise at about 60% intensity in the heat. That when hypohydrated, unlike when you hydrate it, your cardiac output will drop. What Jose showed and has never been shown in exercise in the heat, but without with fluid replacement, is that not only will the cardiac output drop, as, as many of us have shown, is he clearly showed that your skeletal muscle blood flow will decrease. That this reduction in cardiac output can actually impact on oxygen delivery to the skeletal muscles. And this has been shown, studied many times, and you, had, you hydrated individuals in the heat, and it's never been shown. But in hypohydrated people, it's been shown. Now, another thing is that if we look at use of substrate, um, there's many older studies, uh, Andy Young, Daryl Neufer, uh, Mark Fabreo and Hargraves, but this is a recent study because I think the data is a lot clearer out of Larry Lawrence Spreet's lab, um, where they had individuals exercise, and they had them exercise in the heat, and they had them exercise either euhydrated and dehydrated, and they looked at muscle glycogen usage. And what you can see is when you're dehydrated, you have greater skeletal muscle glycogen utilization. So, if you were to exercise long enough and skeletal muscle glycogen utilization was a factor that would limit performance, you can see that the utilization is higher. And this is probably due to two reasons. One, the higher muscle temperature and also the higher plasma epinephrine levels uh, based on Hargrave's work. So I've shown you a picture that certainly the cardiovascular system is involved. Certainly there may be metabolic changes. But I don't think that fairly shows the entire picture. Here's some experiments where uh, Scott got individuals, uh, Scott Montaigne, and what we were interested in was if we decrease muscle water, um, can we look within the muscle, at least in terms of the, uh, um, the, the muscle pH and, and the uh, high energy phosphates in the muscle that we might be able to see a difference in muscle metabolism? So in these experiments, we don't have to fight the effects of posture and gravity. People are supine and it's actually cool because it's cool inside of a magnet. And Scott had them do leg, prolonged leg kick exercise. What he found is when he did actual dehydration with maximum, vol maximum strength that there's no difference. But as he's shown with others that when you do sustained small muscle uh, work that there's a reduction in performance. He showed about a 15% reduction. And you can see when you look at all the individuals, the line of identity, that basically almost everybody showed this reduction in kickability. When you look within the muscle though, surprisingly, although there's a smaller total muscle, muscle water, we weren't able to see any difference in, in pH or any of these uh, high energy phosphates. So there may be something going on. There may be multiple mechanisms. It's not all the cardiovascular because we could do it in a cool and small muscle. And in fact, uh, Xavier Brigard's done the same thing, but uh, basically he did isometric contractions, prolonged isometric contractions at 25% MVC, and he showed, again, that small muscle performance was degraded by dehydration, and he showed that with that, that uh, you can see the performance decreased, there was additional earlier activation or recruitment of fibers, and the firing rate declined faster. So it appears to be something that's going on either within the muscle or probably within the central nervous system. And there are some recent studies, and again, this is some of the work that we're following up at Georgia Tech, but Kempton's done some nice work and very preliminary data where he's got in individuals, he's had very low levels of dehydration, and he's looked at the, basically the bold response within the brain. And what you can do, this tells you about neuronal activity at different portions of the brain. And what you can see is compared to euhydration, he's reporting increased bold responses. So the brain's basically having to activate basically more neurons to do a given cognitive task in this instance so that there are definitely changes within the CNS that need to be appreciated. So as we look at physiological mechanisms, I think that we can say that physiological mechanisms impairing performance with heat stress are accentuated by hypohydration, same mechanisms but accentuated, and that there's multiple mechanisms involved of different systems. Now, I was asked to talk very briefly on hypervolemia and hyperhydration. And the first thing I'm going to talk is hypervolemia. As we've said that, if you decrease your plasma volume or your blood volume, 
that that's negative in terms of thermoregulation and in terms of performance. What I'm going to present some studies that we had done years ago is where we've done the studies and also Ethan Adell's lab did similar studies. Uh, since I'm speaking, I'll show you my data, but uh, his data is every bit as impressive, and Sue Fortney's, is that what we did is in these experiments, we got individuals and we infuse human albumin so that we could expand the plasma volume, just like you do with hetoclamidization. You can drive up the oncotic pressure, you pull fluids in, so plasma volume is expanded. So if you expand plasma volume here and you have people exercise in the heat, again, normal condition, and with the expanded expansion by about 13%, which is, is, is very substantial, what you find is that if you just expand the plasma volume, that you'll have a lower heart rate because you improve cardiac filling, but there's real, really, oops, really no impact on either skin temperature, uh, core temperature, or sweating responses. So that expanding the plasma volume, although it may be supportive of the cardiovascular system, it has no real thermoregulatory or performance impact, at least in our hands and in the hands of others. Now, as you know, the blood volume is made up of plasma and red blood cells. We had done a number of studies over the years where we preferentially just expanded the red blood cell mass by taking out units of blood, storing them by high glycerol freezing, waiting a couple of months, re rejuvenating the red blood cells and putting them back in. So what happens, though, if you look at just the red cell mass? Here's experiments uh, that just showing two, two representative subjects. So we actually had about four subjects we could show this on, <laughs> so we don't have statistical significance. But all the people that basically had the red cell mass and the exercise and the heat, all of them, by the way, showed improved lower rectal temperatures. You can see uh, that when, uh, well, what you can see is, is that in this instance here, for these individuals, they performed exercise longer, okay? And they were probably exercising harder. So all the subjects that incurred heat exhaustion when they had the additional red cell mass that we were able to get exhaustion data on, both euhydrate, both uninfused and infused, all showed a performance increase. What we did show, though, is this, based on a number of studies, and here's one of them right here, is that when you increase the red cell mass and you have an, whoops, you have an individual exercising in the heat, okay, moderate intensity exercise in the heat, and you look at the steady state core temperature, line of identity, that individuals with an increased red cell mass all had a lower steady state core temperature. And when you take the data from a number of studies where we manipulated these things, and you do the forcing function analysis in terms of sweat response. So you look at the core temperature where the sweating response turned on, and then once it turned on, what was the slope of that response? You can see that individuals that were infused with red cell masses basically turned on their sweating earlier, and once the sweating turned on, they had higher levels. So if you manipulate then just components of the blood volume, that plasma volume, although that's what we talk about and it's easily measured, it really has a cardiovascular effect but not thermoregulatory, but red cell mass does have a huge thermoregulatory effect. Well, what happens then if you just expand the total body water? And we've done a number of experiments, as of others, where we would use both water hyperhydration and glycerol hyperhydration to expand total body water. And this was Bill Latska's doctoral work. And you can see here that if you give water or glycerol, you can increase your total body water about one and a half liters. So if you're a 45 liter total body water, you might get up to 46 and a half. Not a great amount. If you're exercising then with a hyperhydration or euhydration, that there's no real effect on the thermoregulatory system. Here you can see esophageal temperature, not much difference between the conditions. And if I wanted to spend the time on sweating and skin blood flow responses, there's not much difference. If you then take those people to uncompensable heat stress, so that they're going to walk to exhaustion, that even with hyperhydration, if we look at the difference between euhydrated and hyperhydrated, here's no difference, and here's the individual subjects. One of these would be glycerol hyperhydration, the other one would be water hyperhydration. You can see there might be a tendency that they might walk a little longer, that they might be more resilient, but there's no statistical difference. And the reason for this is, is that Basically, the total body water was elevated, so the plasma volume declined a little bit slower, and they were able to sustain performance maybe a little bit better. But then that effect is, is that if I look at hyperhydration and hypovolemia, which is the opposite of hypohydration, so we look at overvolume expansion, 
is that expansion, plasma volume expansion, will reduce cardiovascular strain, but I feel it has no impact on thermoregulation or exercise heat tolerance. Red cell mass, which doesn't change with heat acclimatization, though, will not only reduce cardiovascular strain, but it improves thermoregulation and performance. And if we look at hyperhydration, which a lot of folks worry about ways to hyperhydrate, that you can spend a lot of time, you'll increase your urine output, but it really doesn't have much impact. So in conclusion from my entire talk, I think these are the points that I'd like you to take away. One, hypohydration is common during exercise heat stress. Hypohydration impacts on all fluid compartments and tissues. Hypohydration impairs aerobic performance with heat stress and high altitude exposure. Multiple physiological mechanisms are responsible. That erythrocyte and volume or red cell volume, not plasma volume expansion, improves thermoregulation and exercise heat performance. And hyperhydration, overdrinking, really has no impact on thermoregulation or exercise heat performance. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Saka, thank you for your talk. We can tell you've talked about it once or twice. So um, when you talk about hypohydration impairing aerobic performance and heat stress, is this independent of age? Or if people ask, well, if we look at older adults, would this be more augmented in, in older individuals uh, continuing in exercise? I don't know. Um, I've never done experiments with older populations. If anybody would have, it would have been Larry Kinney. And I don't know that he's looked at the performance aspect of it. Um, there's reasons you could hypothesize why it might be a more problem, but I, I don't know. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, if you were to kind of summarize a lot of your findings, which are generally geared towards military populations for um, the general population exercising, being afraid to exercise in the heat and very worried about their fluid replacement, uh, what kind of recommendations would you have for that? Well, I, I, um, you make recommendations for the entire population. And I think that the recommendations in the American College of Sports Medicine Physician Statement are right on. And basically what you're telling individuals is that if they're exercising in the heat, they really shouldn't have to worry too much until, and you're trying to make this simple, you have about a 2% reduction in body mass. But really, we're talking a 3% reduction in total body water. So if it's an obese person, it's going to be before a 2% reduction in body mass reduction. That basically, if you want to optimize performance, that you want to stay within these limits. And that they should try to figure out a way to replace fluids so that uh, they don't exceed that level if they're exercising in a warm, hot environment. Simple, consistent with findings back from the 40s and 30s, and uh, I, I can't imagine why it's controversial. Uh, let me ask a question, actually. You, you saw some really interesting data on uh, dehydration and brain volume. Uh, do you think that these changes in brain volume might impact cognitive impairments? Or we might have seen, there is some indication in the literature that... Uh, yeah, you know, and, and, and that's... Um, I don't know, and, and this is something that we're collecting pilot work on because it's an area that we want to emphasize and, and, and put in a, a grant to look at. I can tell you my bias, and my, my bias is every, every investigator is biased by their own data because they think it's better than everybody else's, but it's probably not, okay? So there's two reasons I've, I've been skeptical of the impact of dehydration on cognitive performance. One is, is that when we do it, we, we don't see much. 
but we, we never see much with cognitive performance with anything we do. So it might be the tools we use, but it might not, okay? Two is that I, my, one of my old chairs when I was teaching physiology was a great believer in teleology, that things happen for a reason. If cognitive decision making is important for mankind's survival, probably shouldn't be one of the first things to go, okay? Now, there are a number of studies, and when you look through, and I've been trying to, in my own mind, understand why there might be differences, is there are studies that do show cognitive performance deficits. And, you know, your first flush is, well, maybe they picked and choose. But when you look at it, a lot of the tests line up to the same kinds of things that you did. And I'm starting to form an opinion that it might be like exercise performance in the heat. That when you start looking, if some of these things that have been shown before, that you start basically getting anatomical, you start getting functional outcomes within the brain, the brain's got to dig de deeper in its resources. So now what happens is if you haven't had that long of a recovery from exercise or from some other perturbation, it may start appearing. So we think that this might be very important for certain populations and certain occupational and military types of missions. And it, and it really would be something if it actually occurred. But we don't know that, and that's some of the things we're trying to figure out right now. Hi, I'm J.D. Adams. I'm working on my PhD in exercise science here at the University of Arkansas. Exercise science, simply put, is understanding how to maximize the body's health and performance. I'm interested in the science of heat and hydration in both healthy people and people with medical conditions. Let me show you what students and faculty are studying in the Human Performance Laboratory at the U of A. Concussions are a serious concern for athletes of all ages. Dr. R.J. Elbin studies the neurocognitive, physical, and psychosocial effects of sport-related concussion in youth and college-age athletes. His research focuses on identifying factors that influence concussion risk and recovery. Whoa, Dr. Michelle Gray does research on functional fitness to help older adults live independently as long as possible. She studies muscular power, an aspect of fitness that gets to the heart of the matter. Maintaining adequate muscular power helps prevent fall injuries, the leading cause of both fatal and non-fatal injuries among older adults. Mm. Well, how'd I do? JD, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is you survived the test. The bad news is the worst reading we've ever seen. Man, I need to work on my core strength. Dr. Barry Brown created this device called the ab test to quantify core strength. His research has shown that sit-ups measure abdominal muscle endurance, not strength. Building the core reduces lower back pain and enhances athletic performance. Wow, there's some fascinating stuff in here. Diabetes begins with insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle. Dr. Nicholas Green is researching how we can use exercise to combat those effects. His research is working toward ways we can prevent diabetes and related diseases or lessen their severity. Dr. Tyrone Washington's research focuses on how different physiological conditions, such as obesity and aging, affect muscles' ability to recover from damage. <sighs> Nothing like water to quench your thirst, but too little water can have a big impact on a person's health, exercise performance, and cognitive function. By artificially inducing thirst and monitoring the body's response, Dr. Stavros Kavaris shows that even small degrees of dehydration can also affect kidney function, glucose metabolism, and hormonal changes. Man, this suit is hot, but researchers use it to study body temperature control. Dr. Matthew Ganio's research focus is on understanding how hydration and heat stress affect people with medical conditions such as diabetes and obesity. The findings from this research have implications for how to improve long-term cardiovascular health. Man, it's hot in there. But Dr. Brendan McDermott needs a heat chamber like this to do research on prevention and treatment of exertional heat stroke and hydration status in athletes. His studies can have profound benefits not only for athletes, but also people such as soldiers and those who work in extreme weather conditions. Well, what do you think? Pretty cool stuff, huh? Many of our graduates go on to work in clinical, sport, and academic settings. 
If any of this interests you, visit our website. You can be a part of the important research going on to help people live healthier lives. We look forward to hearing from you.